Hey, welcome to The Perspective today. I'm Mike Sherbinal. And if you're watching the news like I do every day, uh, there is a, a perplexing and a very complex situation that always seems to be raising its head. And that is, how do we understand what is happening in Israel, in the Middle East? How do we interpret things? Uh, where is injustice being done? And how do we interpret the outpouring of anger and sympathy that we see in Canada and the United States. Uh, we see it in the protests. We see it in the marches. We see it shaping the political uh, horizon all around us, whether you're watching in the States or watching in Canada. And uh, I asked today Jonathan Feldstein to come back on the program with us. Uh, Jonathan is the author of, of this amazing book on the 75th anniversary of Israel. I'm holding it up here. It's much prettier to look at than my face, but it's uh, the Genesis 123 Foundation, of which he is president. But Jonathan also has a, a great understanding of life here in the States and in Canada, but he is living in Israel. And Jonathan, thank you for coming back on with us again today. This is an amazing book that you've written. And if people want to go to Amazon, they can get a copy of it. But I wanted you to describe what's behind the pages of this book and what it's all about before we jump into the subject of the day. This is one of the greatest God moments in my life. Thank, first of all, thank you, Mike. It's really a pleasure to be back with you as always. Um, in October of 2022, six months before Israel was celebrating its 20th, 75th anniversary, I was God downloaded this amazing idea to publish a book of 75 essays by Christian leaders from all over the world writing about why Israel was significant um, in honor of that anniversary. And I contacted a friend who was a publisher, and I had been speaking with him about a completely different project, and said, hey, David, what do you think? And he loved the idea. He improved upon the idea. And really miraculously, as in the title of the book, nine months later, from the conception to delivery of the electronic file to the printer here in Israel, we had a book. And it's magnificent. It's 75 essays. Christian leaders of multiple denominations from every continent except Antarctica, ranging in age from 20s to their, to their 90s, and uh, multiple ethnicities, people writing in English and other languages, <laughs> which are which are their first languages, and we had to translate to English. It's it's I, you know me well enough now. I'm not a very immodest person. I don't think I'm the greatest things in sliced bread. I pinch myself every time I look at a copy of the book and see my picture and my name associated with it because it's still miraculous to me that we were able to pull this off and it's been so widely re well received. We, uh, As of about a month ago, we sent the second printing to our fulfillment center in the U.S. and it was printed, I'll mention this, in conjunction with the largest printer in Israel that's at Kibbutz Be'eri, which is the largest um, community along the Gaza border, where I happened to have been yesterday that was devastated by the October 7th terrorist attack. So we're yeah. investing our, our, our time, our, our everything that we do with this project is really investing back into the uh, recovery in Israel and, and various social welfare projects that bless Israelis of all backgrounds. Well, Jonathan, one of the reasons you're on the program so many times is that I, I you're in front of me all the time. I pick up this book and I see it and I'm thinking about you and uh, I'm excited for what you've accomplished. And I've only had one trip to Israel and there's so much more that I want to see. But every time I look at this book, it just brings back so many great memories. And I just want to encourage people to pick up a copy of it. And in the same way, in doing that, you're supporting an incredible, incredible project. Yes. Jonathan, Tell the people where you live right now, and we're going to talk about some uh, hard things that are happening right now in Israel, and I want you to help me to unpack it. So just thank what you. recently has been happening to you with the rockets flying over and all that terrible stuff. Yeah, everywhere we go, there are rockets flying, and there's the threat of much more. I live in a town called Efrat. If you, depending on your translation of your Bible, you'll read it as Efrat or Efrata, as where Rachel died, as where Boaz uh, was given a blessing by the elders to uh, live and prosper in Ephrat when he was marrying Ruth. And uh, there are other biblical references as well. We're 
just a notch south of Bethlehem. And uh, I think from my window to the north, this direction, we're about 14, 15 kilometers from the center of Jerusalem. So it's the Judean mountains. Um, some people refer to it pejoratively as the West Bank. And I don't mind using that term because I want people to understand that just outside this window, I have a Palestinian Arab village called Abdullah Ibrahim, who are our neighbors. And until October 6th, it was relatively peaceful. But since October 7th, um, the reality on the ground has changed significantly here. And uh, where we are 40 miles uh, north and east of the north the northern corner of the Gaza Strip. And on October 7th, so people know, uh, we woke up that morning with, with uh, uh, dozens of rockets being fired in the area and multiple air raid sirens sending us downstairs to our bomb shelter. Um, yeah, and, and, we, and, we, and I should mention we're about 150 miles, I think, from the Lebanese border, and that is still in range from what Hezbollah has in Lebanon to reach us. It's all very interesting. Uh, I want to jump in with uh, with a question that uh, I don't think I've ever raised, uh, certainly with you, but it came up between my wife, Terry, uh, and myself as we were talking about how hatred is infused into us and how we have such negative thoughts about people. And there's oftentimes we couldn't explain the foundation. And noticing how little children are taught to hate other people, uh, whether it's children of Hamas or Palestinians that might hate Israelis or vice versa, or it could be uh, the hatred we have towards uh, Russians or, you know, Germans, Ukrainians, the list goes on and on. Talk to me about what you see as the hatred that is instilled almost from birth uh, with Hamas. Um, it, it is from birth, and it's very sad. You see with, with the Palestinian Arab women um, all around here and certainly in Gaza under the control of uh, Hamas for the last few decades, raising their children to be martyrs. And they and they celebrate that. They actually they actually believe that somehow it, it sanctifies their God to kill uh, Israelis and Jews. And and it's not ju- and it, it, it's important to draw a distinction. It's not just Israeli Jews. Israelis and Jews all over the world. Now, I should, we should mention, and you know this, um, Islamic extremism is no more kind to Christians around the world, particularly in our part of the world. And you do see that. You see children being raised in Hamas summer camps with toy rifles and learning the, learning the chants that Jews, that they say in Arabic, Jews are descendants of apes and pigs and from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. These are things that are genocidal calls to kill us because they they believe that we have, they don't read the Bible and they don't have a relationship with the creator of the universe. And therefore, they don't understand that not only do we belong here, but this is the only piece of land deeded to a people on the face of the earth over thousands of years, a covenant that's, that's never been broken and that that I always say the solution for, for the problems, for the lack of peace that we have, has nothing to do with the lack of existence of a Palestinian state, but rather the very existence of the Jewish state. And that's what we saw on October 7th. We saw the attempted, we saw a tremendous dehumanization and an attempted genocide. And if they could have, they would have. You know, I so let me push back a little bit. I'm going to ask you now a question. In light of the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, yes. uh, I was interested in reading the rhetoric from uh, Melania, uh, former President Trump's wife, from the Biden administration, uh, and from Trump himself, that we need to de-escalate the violence, yes. that we can't have hatred. In. And I applaud all of that. So when you grow up knowing that people are taught from child, from infancy, to hate you, how do you process that wow. as a Jew? And you're a father, so um, how, how did you? How do you correct that for your children? Um, part of the reason October seventh was able to happen is because so many Israelis mistakenly believed, 
and, and by the way, I'll put myself in that category in what in Hebrew is called the conceptia, the conception that if we coexist nicely, if we employ them in our communities, if we give them self-determination in their own communities under the Palestinian Authority and negotiate in good faith toward peace, that they will live in peacefully, even if you fund with hundreds of millions of dollars a month into their communities. Um, that yeah. conception is wrong, and it's and it's upended the um, the thinking of people like myself. Um, I surely never raised my kids, nor do my children raise my grandchildren to hate Arabs. We don't hate anybody. We hate terrorism. We hate the terrorists yeah. who 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 are committed to our uh, destruction. But we don't we don't raise that. You never hear that in our home. And, and it's a tremendous minority in the people and state of Israel. But October 7th changed things because it doesn't make us hate them anymore, but it makes us unable to know if we can really trust them. Today I was at a grocery store and I saw a man, a Jewish man, greet one of our Palestinian Arab neighbors who was a worker there, who I've seen in the store before. And they greeted each other very warmly. They knew each other. How are you? How are you? How's your family? And that's nice. And that kind of coexistence does exist. And but but love that. there's a more of a barrier here now. Jonathan, we're going to take a short break. We're going to be back in a moment to talk more about this very complex subject. And I want to remind you folks, go to Amazon and get a copy of this amazing book, Israel, the Miracle, chronicling the 75th anniversary of the nation of Israel. You're watching The Perspective. If at any time you'd like to talk to somebody, you'd like someone to pray with you, call our toll-free number, 855 855- 9106297 I'm going to be right back in just a moment Back here with Jonathan Feldstein, the author of Is the Miracle of Israel, fantastic book that I encourage you to get. Go to Amazon, order it. Maybe order one as a special gift for a, a gift, rather, for a special friend of yours. But Jonathan, let's continue talking about this complex problem. And I know along the border where you travel and, and the Gaza border, you're talking about youth that are at risk and yes. all the horrific memories that are being raised up. Uh, for family members uh, who had loved ones that went through the Holocaust. Talk to us about those two subjects. So yesterday I had a profound experience visiting the Gaza border area. I mentioned Kibbutz Be'eri. That's the largest of the kibbutz, a communal uh, um, com- a communal settlement that's four kilometers from the Gaza border. They had 101 people out of 1,200 killed on October 7th, uh, 51 taken, uh, if I remember correctly, 51 who were taken hostage, many killed uh, since then. And what I learned there was really fascinating to go and see the devastation of the community. And the community has to, because it's a collective, if I don't I don't know where you live, I assume you have a private home of some sort like I do, uh, we own our homes or we have a mortgage that leads us to own our homes. In a communal uh, institution like this, they make group decisions about what to do, including the ultimate demolition of these homes that I saw that were torched in which so many people were killed. And wow. and, and you, you see and you hear from the children, children haven't been able to come back yet because it's still too devastating. That's part of the reason that they're contemplating de- uh, destroying and demolishing entire neighborhoods of not just this one community, but m- multiple communities like it. And I'll, and I'll come back to that point, but then in the evening, I had one of the most uplifting experiences. We've been funding a program in Steyrot, which is uh, several miles from Kibbutz Be'eri. It's, a, it's the largest city on the Gaza border that's less than a kilometer from Gaza with a population of about 35,000 people. In any society, you have people, parents, 
who ra- who are raising children. You, it's very easy to become a parent biologically, but not everyone has the ability to be a good parent, to have the skills skill sets for multiple reasons. And sometimes we know this reality that parents not only can't raise their children well, but even harm their children, not on purpose, but because they don't have the ability. So we've been funding a nonprofit there that works with at-risk youth. Yesterday, I was very blessed on behalf of Genesis One Two Three Foundation to present a new twenty-five thousand dollar check to wow. them, uh, which which is so nice because that's coming from Christians all around the world. And the juxtaposition of our investing for the future, which we must do, and a small community of twelve hundred people—well, used to be twelve hundred, now eleven hundred people—trying um, to figure out how they're going to go forward raising their children. And this struck me as being so relevant to questions that survivors of the Holocaust had, some of whom buried their traumas and never told their children or grandchildren. Some of them spoke openly about it. But in either case, they were traumatizing their children and grandchildren. And these are real documented, um, I, I don't know what's the right word, realities of second and third generation Holocaust survivors people who absorb the trauma that their loved ones, their parents, grandparents uh, had during uh, during the Holocaust. So we're it's now almost... entering 85 years later, a new level of trauma yeah. that will carry throughout the next century. It's almost as if the children are living it vicariously through the stories that they've heard. And I can't even begin to imagine the horrific, pictures that are going through their minds, uh, the trauma that they're feeling. Uh, I know when I've been to the Holocaust Museum, I didn't know whether to just weep or throw up. It would just, it's, it's so much to process. You're right. Um, and so as we pause on that note, you have a great passion for peace. And if yeah. is there a solution? Is there a solution? I'd love to hear your thoughts. There is a solution. And I, and I, wrote something some months ago really to undermine the notion that people talk about the two-state solution. And by the way, I, I full disclosure, I'm one who can make, who could have made the case for a Palestinian state right next door to me um, in order to peacefully coexist. Not since October 7th, because we realized that, again, our existence is their problem, not the lack of existence of a Palestinian Arab state. So I, I wrote something that was a little edgy, that's just a, a revised and that's come out very recently, um, has a long name uh, to the title, but it's basically under the, under the banner, The Solution in, uh, uh, for Peace in Gaza. And my solution for peace in Gaza, which I truly believe is the only solution for peace in Gaza, is to bring, I refer to it as an army of Christian volunteers from all over the world to be responsible for the rehabilitation and restoration and ultimate prosperity of 2.3 million Gazans. Christians who love Gazans, you know this, Christians Christians are the best people. They love everybody. You you show the love of Jesus through everything that you do, and that's amazing, and no reason not to go to Gaza and show that love. But Christians also love Israel and the Jewish people and wouldn't want Gazans— to continue to do harm for themselves by arming and continuing to instill hate in their children and more threats of terror and wouldn't want that for Israel. So my belief, and I and we're, we're now getting uh, traction behind this globally, is that hey. we need to do that. There's not a solution to bring Egypt to control or the Saudis or any other Arab country, even that have peace with us, Because they're part of the problem. They continue to undermine, even if they have peace, they continue to undermine our existence by funneling cash to Hamas and weapons and continuing to make the fuel the tank, fill the tank, if you will. So I'm praying because I want peace and I want the I want prosperity. I want to be able to drive an hour and a half this direction from my house and get a kosher hamburger on the beach in Gaza one day. Well, Jonathan, here's a strange thing. I hope that I can do that with you. I would love yes. to do that. And uh, and if God allows that to happen, it'll be my treat, okay? <laughs> Just Thank hold you. the pickles. All right. Jonathan, All right. We, got, we got 30 seconds left. This amazing book, 
Uh, we're encouraging people to get it from Amazon. Give us your parting thought. What's closest to your heart right now? We have 30 seconds. The book, you know, the book was historic because no one's ever done anything like it in ever in the history of the state of Israel. After October 7th, it became prophetic. And it really shows Christians, even Christians who love Israel and the Jewish people, more why Israel is relevant and why Christians need to be care, be connected and pray and involved with us and our destiny because our destinies and our faiths are so intertwined. Oh, fantastic. Jonathan, again, thank you for coming on, even on short notice. Look forward to the <laughs> ongoing conversation and having that Coke and hamburger with you on the Gaza Strip. Thank you, my friend. Amen. God bless you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us, folks. We're going to be right back as I continue to teach from God's Word. Hi, my name is Ryan Walter, and I played a long time in the National Hockey League. Uh, so long ago, I played against the Philadelphia Flyers back in the day when they were the Broad Street Bullies. Uh, let's talk about fear. <laughs> we, we had some fear. You couldn't be alive and not be afraid in that situation. But you know what's interesting is uh, Napoleon says there's two great levers to move men, fear and interest. But you know what Jesus says? This is crazy. He says, fear not, right? 365 times in the Bible, apparently, it says, fear not. So this week, let's not fear. Let's believe in Jesus. You ever heard the expression that silence can be deafening? There was a, a, a pop song that came out years ago called The Sounds of Silence. And silence seems to sound like something that is quite therapeutic. But on the other hand, silence is something that most of us are not too good at enjoying or even practicing. But all throughout the scriptures, we find that God calls us to be still, to be silent, to learn to pause and to listen for him. You've been in a conversation when the person has been blah, 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 blah. They just keep talking and talking. And I've said to somebody else or often to my wife, I just wish they would hit the pause button for a moment. I can't get a word in edgewise. And it seems like they're not even listening. I wonder sometimes if that has not been the experience that we have with ourselves and God. It's not that God does not speak to us. It's not that we can't hear him. It's just simply we are talking too much and we haven't learned to be still all this week. I'm going to be talking about the sound of silence as we continue in our journey of listening for God's voice. I want to read to you from Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. Let these words just kind of permeate into your heart. It says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Now, if you think about that verse, there's a reason why he says, I'm going to wait on God in silence because he is my rock. He is the one who is sustaining me. But I'd like us to think together about why we often do not hear the voice of God. And silence is such a key part. But why are we afraid of the silence? Well, I want to suggest, first of all, that some people really don't want to hear from God and they won't surrender to God until they first know what he wants. It's like, okay, God, you tell me everything that you're think wanting and, and I'll see if I agree. Whereas God says, no, I want you to come and be still and listen. You know, folks, God wants to talk to you. He wants you to be hearing his voice. Now, another thing that keeps us from hearing God's voice is when there's sin in my life. Sometimes, you know, if I'm just going to be brutally honest, there can be stuff, maybe it's a bitterness or hatred or a lustful thought. The list is endless. But if there's stuff in my life, and that stuff I mean is sin, that's not politically correct, but I'm going to use the word sin. When that stuff is in my heart, I'm not going to hear from God's voice. Why? Because Psalm 66 says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But the good news is this, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So every day I got to be right with God, because why? I want to hear his voice. I want to hear what he's saying to me on how I'm to do relationships, how I'm to respond to that person, 
We've just been listening to what Jonathan has been sharing about the inbred hatred that people have towards one another, even as children were taught that. But God is able to correct that. And when we're listening for his voice, he will speak to you and to me about what is right and what is wrong so that we can live out the potential, the kingdom purpose for which he's created us. Here's a third reason why some people don't hear God's voice. Some have never been taught how to hear God. Yeah. And so Job 33 says, for God does speak now one way and now another, though sometimes man may not perceive it. In other words, I find that God always speaks to me through his word. As I read it, it speaks to my heart. I say, Holy Spirit, help me to understand your word today in the application. Sometimes God has a corrective word or a word of encouragement through a friend who's listening for God's voice. Sometimes when the church comes together to pray, we'll hear what God is saying and there'll be a sense of urgency to respond in a certain way. God speaks in a variety of ways, sometimes through dreams. I know when we pray and when we fast to listen for God's voice, to be still, he speaks. But one of the biggest reasons is for not hearing God's voice is we're just too busy to spend time listening to God. And I want to encourage you to find time, find time each day just to pause and be still and say, Lord, I'm listening. You'll be surprised what he's going to tell you and you will be encouraged. Hi, my name is Alan Gallant, and I'm the executive director of Agora Network Ministries, a ministry that wants to resource you as a believer in Jesus and resource the church. So we provide an academy, we provide seminars, and we provide conferences for you to get help for your own mental health and for your church. So if you want to reach out to us, go to our website, agoranetworkministries.com for help. thinking about listening for God's voice, what is it that he wants to say to you? Let me read to you some of the things he wants you to hear today. They're found in the scripture. In Psalm 46, verse 10, he says, I am your refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, in all things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, for nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And Jesus is saying to you and to me that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he invites us to follow him. And if you've never followed him today, he's asking you to do that. Why don't you just pray and say, Lord, I'm opening up my heart to you. I want you to be my Savior and Lord. Will you call me at that number on your screen, 855-910-6297? We want to hear from you. We want to encourage you as you take this new step of faith and as you start listening for God's voice.